on. Too many things to turn. Oops, too many things to turn on here. <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> we've been doing a lot of talking. I think we still have it too loud, don't we? Or we sounds loud to me. Okay, fine. If it's not blasting out anybody else, it must be my hearing aid. <laughs> Okay, uh, <clears throat> we've been talking a little bit of the last uh, few weeks about worship, and so I thought we'd look at uh, worship today and uh, think about it as uh, what is worship and uh, how do we really do it. So let's see where we are here. We're not doing it. <laughs> Okay, we'll try to get it working here. Uh, <clears throat> we've had, <laughs> there's been a lot of discussion in the newspaper and uh, all because of the uh, uh, telescope has raised a lot of questions about, well, what is worship? What is sacred? Uh, <clears throat> this week, the article said that... Uh, it's not just the mountain that's sacred, but the whole island is sacred. And uh, I don't know for sure, because when you don't define your term sacred, then you can use it any way you want to. Uh, if we say sacred because it was created by God, then that grabs the whole universe. <laughs> so uh, everything's sacred. Uh, we have to be careful, though, because... Sacred can mean a place, which is what this term is being used, or sacred can mean an a action, uh, meeting God. And so this has raised a lot of questions. Sacred actually means uh, to set apart or given to worship so that it's, it's actually not just a place, um, we take our pavilion here. Uh, in one sense, we can say this was not sacred at all until 1030 this morning. And at that time, it became sacred because this is where we're going to meet God and where we're going to worship. And so this will be a place given for worship. Will it be sacred at one o'clock when I finish my message? Or... <laughs> Or, uh, <laughs> some of you didn't catch on fast on that one. <laughs> uh, but will it be sacred when we're not worshiping here? Well, in a sense, because we've set it apart, but not totally because the function, the action, is not really taking place there. And so, is it the mountain, or is it the whole island, or is it the universe, or is it what we're actually doing there. So in, in looking at what is our worship, uh, a healthy church worships. And that's important for us to realize that, that if we're going to be a good, healthy church, we're going to have to spend time in worship. And basically that means that we meet God. Did you come this morning expecting to meet God here? Or do you come saying, well, it's Sunday morning. It's probably time to go to church. Uh, I hope you came saying, I want to meet God. There was a, a pastor that first time I heard him say that, I, I sort of stopped. He said, stood up, and the first thing he said before he started preaching, or as he started preaching, he said, I have a message from God for you today. Whoa. And then I thought, wait, he's going to open God's Word and explain it. He's right that he did have a message from God for you today. Because as we come to worship, as we meet God, we are doing that. We are here to meet God. And so worship is really at the heart of a church. If we were saying what are the most important things, and I don't think we can make a hierarchy here of important things the church does, but if we did, the number one would have to be worship. Because if we're not worshiping God, 
the other things probably don't have any meaning at all. They're just forms that we go through. So, a healthy church worships. Uh, turn in, in your Bibles or follow on the screen or on your iPad, whatever you have, to Acts the second chapter. Look at two verses there about the early church. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts, they meaning the apostles and those new Christians that had followed, started following Jesus. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Uh, as we look at this passage, we see that worship was and is an everyday experience. Uh, they went to the temple courts to do their worship, to praise God there. Now, it's interesting because the temple courts were Jewish worship, and that's why they went there. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about this, but that's what they were doing in the courts there. Now, the courts also became a place of fellowship, a place of sharing, a place of talking about uh, Jesus and how he was a Messiah. And so they went there praising God and sharing what God was doing there. And so they were gathered together in a place for worship. And so they were doing it daily. Now we have once a week that we actually call worship here. But hopefully it's taken place more than just there. Because, uh, because corporate worship is important. Corporate worship is where we worship together where we are thinking about the same thing at the same time, where we're uh, following some thoughts through the songs, through the message, through the scripture, so that we're thinking united there. And that's corporate worship. But it wasn't just in the uh, temple courts. They were also doing it in their homes. And this would be small groups, uh, private worship, uh, a family, or a, a little bigger, you know, family and neighbors, or uh, the few that would gather there to praise God. So it was a continuous throughout the week in the homes as well as in the temple courts, uh, worshiping together. It was an everyday experience because it was praising God. Now, we could spend a whole other sermon talking about what does it really mean to praise God. Um, most of us like praise that we get, and when somebody praises us, you know, we recognize, oh, that's praise. I like that, you know. But what does it mean when we really praise God? And I'm not going to get in a, that whole sermon on it, but it's important to realize that, that praising God is really recognizing His attributes, and his actions and worshiping him because of that. We have to know who he is and what he's doing as we really praise him. So worship is about him. And to extent, some extent we can say worship is all about him. Uh, there was a song a few years back that was very popular and I, and I think we've sung it here. Uh, which is, says it's all about Him. Uh, it's not what we've made it. And, and sometimes we spend so much time trying to get everything right that we forget it's about Jesus. It's about Him. But it's not all about Him in spite of what that song says. But it's also about us. Because if we weren't there, if we weren't here today, worship would not be taking place. We could have the place. We could have even come in, set up the chairs, turn on the power system and go away and say, wow, that place is ready for worship. But it wouldn't be worship. It wouldn't be worship until we are involved in it. There's no such thing as an abstract worship of God. 
uh, sometimes we hear that used, you know, well, here's a little temple that's set up, and so that's worship taking place there. I tell you what, if there's not worship taking place, it's not worship there. If it's, it's not it's sacred, you know, it has to be about us also. And if worship is not causing a change in us, then probably it's not worship either. So it's about God, about Jesus, but it's also about us. Well, worship is more than, because some of the things that we sometimes mistake for worship is music. We have a good praise team. I, I like to hear the praise team. And sometimes I even try to sing to them with them. And if you stand next to me, you'll tell me not to do that. But, uh, you know, if music is great. But if the music is not coming from the heart, it's not worship. It's not praise. If it's just words that you're saying or you say, hey, this is a great melody. You know, I'm going to sing this melody. But if it's not doing something in your life, then it's not really praise. And then <clears throat> another thing, it's not. It's not just feeling good. Um, I like to have messages and I like to hear preachers that preach and, and make me feel good at the end of it. You know, wow, that, that was good. I, I feel good. But, you know, we can feel good for the wrong reasons or, or feel good for a, re, a good reason that's not really related to worship. Uh, I like Reader's Digest. You know, we get it. And, and they have these nice little stories in there about somebody rescuing a cat out of a uh, drain pipe, you know. And, and I read those and I feel good about them. Do I worship? No. You know, I'm just glad somebody did something good for a poor little kitten. But, you know, if we're really going to worship, the feeling good has to be related to God himself, to what Jesus is doing in our lives. And, and we need to feel good, but it needs to be for what God is doing in our lives. And then it's not rituals. Uh, Fortunately, Southern Baptists don't have any rituals, except, wait, this week we said we use the same form of worship that Southern Baptists use in most of the churches. Maybe we do have some rituals, don't we? Yeah, we, we sometimes uh, forget that these rituals uh, get so embedded we don't realize them as rituals, you know, and we just go through it. And... Uh, we don't say, well, what does this mean? We do things without stopping to think, what do they mean? Because they've become a ritual. And, and in Amos, Amos said, these are an abomination to you, an abomination to God. He doesn't like them. Matter of fact, he regurgitates them, you know, so that we better make sure our rituals are things that are really expressing our worship our praise to God. Um, then it's more than just attendance. Um, you know, I like big attendance. You know, I guess all pastors do. We like bigger and bigger, you know. And uh, <clears throat> But, you know, attendance is not, not necessarily worship. Um, I don't listen to much TV evangelist uh, or radio evangelist. I... I don't get much out of it. You know, I guess I'm too critical as to do it. But, but there was one that I listened to because he's extremely popular with TV shows and a big church in Houston and, and people listen to him. And I listened all the way through it. And never once, never once did he mention Jesus Christ. And I thought, how can he call himself Christian? How can he be proclaiming gospel? But he's got, I don't know what it is, 20,000 per Sunday in his worship service in attendance. But are they really there worshiping? Amen. I, hope, I hope when you're here <laughs> that you're paying attention in the music, in the offering, in the, the commitment time, in the message, so that you can say, I'm here. I'm present. 
worshiping God. And then it's more than just listening. Uh, I, I think I've told the illustration of uh, a friend of mine that was the guest speaker at, Rich, at Glorietta, which is our big camp Baptists have, you know, in New Mexico. And it's always such a spiritual experience, such an uplifting experience to go there. And so Tommy had spoken there and brought a tremendous message. And after the service, it ended up that I had spoken to Tommy and he was uh, just right in front of us walking along the path there. And as we walked along there, you know, I began to talk to somebody else, but I noticed this person almost running up to Tommy and grabbed his hand and said, that was a great message. And Tommy, you know, most of us pastors would have said, thank you. Tommy looked at him and said, yeah, it was. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and the guy didn't know what to say. <laughs> he took a couple of steps with Tommy and he turned and said, good night, <laughs> and walked off. You know, but Tommy had it right. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, that was a great message. Thank you. It's a message of what is God doing now because you heard that message. What are you doing about it? And so it's not just listening. It's applying. And <clears throat> praise is important, but it's not the whole of worship. We'll see a little more about that in a minute there. But, <clears throat> but the, the praise is, again, recognizing who God is. We could do praise songs. We could do praise things. But that would not necessarily be praise from the heart. So it's not the whole of worship. Then if it's not those things, then what is it? What is worship in a healthy church? First of all, <clears throat> it has to be pastor led. That the pastor himself has to worship and has to set an example of worship. And he has to be aware that that what he's doing on Sunday morning is not just delivering a message. It's there to bring people to God, into the presence of God, and help them to see God, who He is. And He needs to be able to, to see the whole of the worship. Uh, I know it was Pastor David or somebody else this week I read that said they get to the church before anybody else because they want to set the example and be there first. And because they are there first, they can set the, the, the feeling, set the, the whole theme of what's going to take place in that worship service. And so it has to be pastor-led. It has to be for all ages. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I say sometimes that when I go back and look at my message after I've preached it, you know, I think, oh, preach to this group, but I didn't preach to that group, you know? Uh, do we have something in our worship service for the youngest child and the oldest person? Do we have something for everybody in between, somebody that has a new family and just married, and then somebody that's, that's been married 50 years? Is there something in every service for every age group? There should be. There should be something there for each person that's in attendance. And sometimes we need to think about it, pray about it, and plan for it. And then, is it for all needs? Uh, it's easy. <laughs> One of the things I read this week, a person, a pastor was writing and, and telling how that uh, <clears throat> he was criticizing a great church. Not the same one I was criticizing a few minutes ago. Different one. And he said, they only have the seeker service. Well, seeker services are good. He said, but they're not training disciples. And I was reminded of a church that, uh, another church in Texas there that I attended a number of times, that every year they would have 300 or so baptisms, which I think is great. You know, that many professions of faith. And each year their attendance declined. And somehow they, the pastor was not seeing that 
he was preaching only one type of message, evangelism, instead of there being a discipleship also to help people grow up in the Lord. And so it needs to meet all needs, not just one need or two needs. And then worship needs to be focused. Uh, I think it's great when we have time and and have a regular pastor that that the the worship service can be focused so that all the way through it the songs and the prayers and everything the message will have one theme throughout it uh for we had powerpoint at my church at Kihei uh somebody had painted on the wall there a arch like a, a rainbow it wasn't quite rainbow there and uh, the first Sunday, a few Sundays I was there, it was distracting to me, you know, to have that behind me there. And then I found in the children's room some uh, letters, stick-on letters, you know. And I thought, oh, well, I can put the theme of the worship service up there on that arch, you know. So every Sunday, there's the theme. And everybody knew what we were trying to do that Sunday. And I did that for week after week, you know. And that was for I had PowerPoint, you know, that we could see the theme. And then uh, I would tell the music uh, person, okay, here's what my message is. Here's the theme for the service. And they made sure the songs fit in with that. And so it needs to be focused. Focused on God, focused on Jesus, focused on our needs. There needs to be a focus all the way through it. And then a worship must be faithful. And what do we mean by being faithful? I thought I had another one there. Faithful means that we're here on time, regular time, and we're doing what is faithful, their loyalty, their commitment there, so that we're not here just ritual. We're here because we're faithful to God. And being here helps us to be faithful to God. And so it must be faithful. Now Jesus himself defines worship. And he said to the, the lady at the well, the Samaritan lady there, uh, she was wanting to start a theological argument with him. I always liked the way he handled that, you know. When, she, when Jesus had told her, you know, yeah, you said right, you're not married, you know, you're just living with this guy. And instead of her, you know, trying to defend herself, she be, jumps on the tag and says, oh, but you Jews say you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem and we worship up here. Where should we worship? You know, she's saying, what's sacred there? You thought that was a new argument, didn't you? Uh, <clears throat> that was, she's saying, what's sacred? And Jesus said, yet the time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper must worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, it's not a matter of location. It's not a matter of this place or that place. It's a matter of worshiping in spirit and in truth. One of my favorite stories I love to tell, and I'll, I'll shorten it down for you today, uh, because I think hearing all the details it makes it even better. But I worked one summer with the church, and, and we were building a new auditorium, a huge auditorium. And uh, the pastor there, as we were working one of our breaks, told us the story about how that church got started, that uh, there was a man that his wife attended the home church there. And he never went to church. But every afternoon when he got off from work, he'd go to this little neighborhood bar and he'd sit there and drink until he had to go home. And by then he was well intoxicated. And <clears throat> that was his life. Work, get drunk, go home. She kept praying and kept trying to lead him to the Lord. And finally, 
he went to a revival meeting with her because she said, you've got to do it or else, you know. And he went, and that very first night that he was there, God took a hold of him and, and saved him. The next night, he didn't go to the revival meeting. He went back to his bar. And his wife thought, oh, no, what happened? But he walked into the bar carrying his Bible. And he put it down on the table. And those guys that came over and said, you know, I'll buy you a drink. He said, no, I'm not drinking. I said, I'll have a soda, whatever it was. Anyway, his Bible was on the table. And so it went that way for the rest of the week. And then the next week, his Bible was on the table. And they began to make fun of him. You know, you've got religion now. You know, you're going to be a holy roller. You're going to be the, our preacher here. One day as he sat there, a fellow sat down with him and he said, I've been watching you a few weeks here and something's different. What you have is what I want. The next night there were two Bibles on tables. And it kept going until there were more. And finally the bar had to close down. They couldn't sell enough drinks to stay in business because there were too many Bibles on the table. So the bar sat there empty. The building sat there empty. And the, the church grew, and many people from that area were going to the church. And finally they said, we need a church out there where so many people are going. And they went out there to find a building that would be big enough for the congregation. The only building available was that bar. And that bar became the church. And that was a small building, and we were building a much, much larger building. Why? Because the people, one guy, was worshiping in spirit and in truth. And God took the unsacred and made it sacred there. So, worship must be in spirit. Spirit means it must be our essence, who we really are. Not just whatever fake or whatever ritual we put on, or whatever mask we might use, but the essence of who we really are because God isn't seeing all this external. He's seeing our heart and He knows who we are. He knows what we really feel and so it has to be our essence and it has to be our totality. That it's not just a part of us. It's not something that we put on on Sunday and when we leave church on Sunday we hang it up on the fire hydrant out there and come back and get it next Sunday. No, it's not that way. It's who we are totally. And then worship must be in truth, meaning it must be sincere, that we really mean it. It must be honest, that we're not faking anything as we come here and worship. It must be faithful. And that means that we must really be regular in our worship, not just occasion. So having said all that, how do we prepare for worship? First of all, we need to prepare our thoughts. I hope before you got here this morning, you begin to prepare to worship. You begin to think about God. Hopefully you put on a, a piece of music maybe that did it. Or you read a scripture or you thought, you know, this is one of the favorite things I can do each week and, and I enjoy it. I'm going to meet some people there who are Christians like me and, and I want that excitement in my life there. And so prepare our thoughts. And then we want to prepare our hearts, our emotions, our sensitivity. Now, you know, most of the time we have little kids and we're trying to get the kids ready for church and we're rushing and, and things are getting a little hectic there. And so it's easy to, to have one attitude and then we say, wow, now I've got to have another one as I come to worship. But we should come preparing our hearts for worship. And we're really there to speak to God and let Him speak to us. And then we need to prepare our time, that it's God's time. Now, you know, we pretty well uh, know our time frame here. Uh, June and I went to a church on the mainland, and, and we enjoyed so much being in that church. It was a different experience for us. And uh, <clears throat> it was a Sunday that they were having one of the championship games. 
And the preacher, uh, we found out that we were late getting there. We thought that started at one time, but actually started earlier than that, about 15 minutes earlier than what we thought. And so by the time it got to the worship, to the message part, it was already almost time for the game to start. And the preacher began to preach, and he kept going on and on, you know. Nobody was getting impatient. Nobody got up and left, you know. And finally, after about, oh, 45 minutes to an hour of his preaching, he said, now, I know some of you are anxious to get to the game, so I'm going to finish pretty soon here. And he took another 30 minutes after that, you know. And nobody got up to leave because they were there to hear and to worship. And it wasn't that time was important. I, uh, my brother worked with a group of people in Africa. And I asked about the worship service. What's it like and how long does it go? He said, oh, it goes all afternoon. And I said, all afternoon? <laughs> said, yeah. I said, the, you know, they come over. They have to walk there. And so once they get there, they're ready to stay, you know, and, and worship as long as anybody there is to lead them in worship and help them in worship. And even when they're not, you know, when the, the message is done, everything, they still hang around to do a little more fellowship and worship. And our time should be, Lord, it's in your hands. And it's your time, not ours. And then we need to come expecting to worship. How do we do that? First of all, we realize his promise. I'm with you. That He is here with us. He's invited us into His presence. And He's here with us. And then we accept His invitation. When Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you'll find rest in me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And so we need to come to Him. As I thought about this, I thought of the different ones, different passages in the Scripture where uh, different people worshipped. Uh, the passage I read at the opening there was where uh, Paul worshipped and he fell down to the, before Jesus there. And I thought about Moses worshipping up on a mountain and his, he came back with this face glowing so much. People said, put on a veil. We can't stand than that much brightness from you. Uh, and I thought about John in, in uh, uh, Revelation where he falls down and the, the, the angels are falling down in worship too and the, the saints there. And so I thought maybe the best one though is Isaiah, the sixth chapter there where we are to see God as He is. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Here were the seraphims bowing down before Him. And, and you see all of this in the glory of God there. And so he saw God as He really is. And that's what we need to do, to see God as He is. And in that... Isaiah realized his own sinfulness. When we stand in the presence of God, all of our excuses and all of our reasons fall away. We have to come and say, I'm sinful, that I've committed sin. And Isaiah said, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. And then we repent. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. And, and so he was repenting of his sins. And then the result is that the angel flew over, the seraphim flew over to the, to the altar there and took a coal off of the altar and, and touched his lips with it as a purifying action that we are cleansed. And as we come to worship, we also have our sins forgiven. We come acknowledging them and, and expecting God to forgive them. Your guilt is taken away. And then we make a commitment, even as Isaiah did when he said, Hear my send me. God had said to Isaiah, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And, and I like this. 
you know, the English does not do what the Hebrew does here as you read it in the Hebrew because you don't get the excitement of uh, Isaiah saying, here am I. You know, I can remember back to especially grade school when, you know, the teacher would ask a question and kids would raise their hands and the uh, teacher would call on someone. And, um, you know, I was always usually the one back, you know, two rows back there that I didn't raise my hand. I was afraid she would call on me, you know. <laughs> and uh, every now and then, I'd know the answer. And I'd want her to call on me because I knew the answer. And so I'd raise my hand, and it wasn't just raising my hand, you know, it was waving it back and forth, you know. And sometimes just almost standing up out of the seat, you know. Here am I. See me. And this is what Isaiah is saying. God said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah bounces out of his seat, waves his hand and says, here am I. Send me. And I hope as we leave here today, we are saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, as we come to our commitment time, I want my worship to be meaningful. I will prepare my heart to meet you. And maybe you'll want to say, Lord, I realize my sinfulness and ask your forgiveness. As the praise team comes to lead us in our closing song, we want this time to be an altar call, an invitation to you to make a decision that, that God has put on your heart. Maybe it's, it's what is on the screen there. Lord, I want to, my worship to be meaningful. I want to make a commitment there. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I've been sinful. I've never accepted you as my Lord and Savior. And I want to accept you this morning to give my heart and my life to you. You've promised forgiveness as I come repenting. And so God will forgive you. And I'll be here to to share with you, to pray with you. And as you make a commitment and you want to share that with me, come forward here during this invitation time to let God speak to your heart and minister to you. Let's stand.